Welcome back to the No Show, everyone. I'm Josh, your humble host, and it is my duty, nay, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, video games, analog horror, and sci-fi, and really anything else that I think is groovy. I hope you'll enjoy tonight's offerings. Content for the blood god. On with the show tonight. I have for you um, something from Curious Archive. What happens after a god goes mad? And I cannot, I can't ignore that that premise. So we're gonna find out um, whether it's a thought experiment or something. We'll, we'll figure it out. So uh, let's let's see what's up. It's actually not that funny. The idea of a god driven mad. I wasn't laughing as a child when I discovered that under the cartoonish waters of the Wind Waker lay a kingdom-sized graveyard, a land drowned by the very deities that gave the world life. Your gods destroyed you, remarks Ganondorf, the game's antagonist. And there's this face that Link makes. That was me. That was nine-year-old me trying to figure out why I felt the king of demons maybe at a point. The notion that humans are insects to the divine appears across mythology. So what happens after a god decides to squash us? After mercy turns to cruelty, sanity to inane destruction, what happens after? A divine body is born from the uterus of a mad dream, and thus the world itself grows sick with despair. This is the world we see from the first moments of Kentaro Miura's dark fantasy epic Berserk, a land where madness now lives in the very whisper of the wind, where nightmares gather in service of their new god, a god who was once but a man. Indeed, all godlike beings who reign in this narrative were formerly human, but have literally and figuratively lost their humanity in pursuit of divine strength. For ascension to godhood requires a sacrifice so inhumane, only the most ruthless would accept the terms. The pursuit of power is the ultimate corrupting force in Berserk, spurring mortals down paths to monstrous godhood. This holds true for the story's youngest twisted deity, who we learn was once a knight named Griffith, a man whose obsession with creating a perfect kingdom led him to make a dark bargain for supremacy. Berserk questions whether those who seek power will always be consumed by it, if figures like Griffith are fated to be corrupted. Throughout the story, we see both mortals and gods offload responsibility for their cruel actions onto forces of destiny, attributing personal failings to divine will. But while Berserk is a narrative where deities are real and just the worst, it's also a story where regardless of any godly predestination, choices have been shown to matter. And beyond fate or the dark influence of power, Griffith made a choice. He chose to be cruel, and so the world is crueler for it. If a god allows themselves to turn mad with power, it's comforting to think they might somehow be turned back. When a minor deity becomes corrupted in the Zelda series, their madness usually manifests as some literal eyeball-covered parasite, and therefore the darkness can be removed with a well-placed arrow, excised like a rotten tooth. However, despite the destruction they've caused both directly and indirectly, the series' main deities cannot be cured in the same way. Their callousness, their sickness, does not manifest so literally. And without hope of changing their deities, most characters instead do not question their actions, no matter how ruthless. Accepting the cruelty of a higher power one is helpless against is understandable. Worshipping said cruelty, that demands investigation. In the game Blasphemous, a supernatural force known simply as the Miracle distributes sickening curses with an unjust hand. And yet this power is revered, venerated by a population who see themselves as deserving of torment. 
It's no accident that Blasphemous takes heavy inspiration from bubonic plague-era Spain, with its crowds of flagellants and bloodletters, people who saw self-punishment as the courteous response to what they believed to be a divine reprimand. I think it's easy, when looking back on this era, to find such practices darkly comedic. But Blasphemous explores the tragedy inherent to these penitent souls, sympathizing with their painful and ill-advised attempts to regain a semblance of control, to rationalize a world gone mad. For if a plague can be neither cured nor avoided, how can one go on, unless believing it a miracle? Interpreting madness as miraculous is the beating heart beneath the floorboards of the Hellblade games. Across the series, the main character Senua is tormented by dark gods, giants, and keepers of the dead, and other characters flock to Senua, putting their faith in her visions. The grim undercurrent to the series is that what Senua sees doesn't seem to be real in the literal sense. She's suffering from a form of psychosis, exacerbated by trauma, but because she's living in the 8th century, Senua has no way to interpret her hallucinations, other than as the presence of cruel deities. An illuminatingly similar misidentified psychosis seems to be at work in the game Indica, in which a nun in 19th century Russia tries to ignore the voices and visions encouraging her to misbehave, which she believes to be the work of, well, you can probably guess. These games blur the lines of personal and divine insanity, leaving you unsure where the mental rot truly stems from. Though occasionally manifesting as on-screen hallucinations, much of Indica's declining mental state is conveyed through camera angles and abrupt changes in style, the game's aesthetic sensibilities rocketing between those of an Ingmar Bergman film and an 80s arcade game. In sharp contrast to Hellblade, which strives for an unbroken cinematic experience, Indica is determined to remind you of its gameness, even leaving a goofy scoreboard on screen for serious moments. It's a choice that draws attention to the interactive nature of the medium, putting an uncomfortable spotlight on the player themselves. Though subtler, Hellblade does have its own fourth wall breaking moments of confrontation, where Senua looks right at the camera, seemingly right at you. It feels like a reminder that, in a way, there is a mad god controlling both Senua and Indica, isn't there? Yes. Through virtue of their interactivity, games have a uniquely metafictional capacity to explore cruel gods. Sometimes the player gets to act as divine overseer, given supremacy over virtual subjects, and considering how people play The Sims, Berserk might have a point about how quickly godly power corrupts. But perhaps more affecting are games where mad gods are given power over the player. You see this overtly in titles like God of War, where the bloodthirsty Thor invades the game over screen to force you to continue fighting, or in Hades 2, where the titan of time Kronos refuses to let you pause. It's a clever trick to convey the power of a deity, as if they're going to escape the bounds of their own medium. But there's a darker method of putting the player at the mercy of a mad god. The game Fear and Hunger features a pantheon of suitably nightmarish deities with twisted urges, but it's not so much the gods themselves that make the game terrifying. Fear and Hunger is exceptionally good at making you feel mechanically powerless, using spikes in difficulty and psychologically crushing setbacks to break down your will, to immerse you utterly in the experience of being at the mercy of a deity's nightmarish whims like with Indica or Hellblade. While trying to beat the game, I felt acutely aware of myself as a player, but this time not as a controller. Rather, I was the one being controlled, unable to turn away despite the punishing hardship. It's a feeling I've only experienced once before. With its colorful sci-fi aesthetic, Rain World doesn't seem as nightmarish as a title like Fear and Hunger, nor does it seem like a setting that would house a mad god. As for the first point, don't let the cuteness fool you, Rain World's ecosystem is highly unforgiving. As for the second, well, throughout one's first playthrough, there is a sense that you're slowly descending deeper and deeper into the heart of something you have no name for. 
until at last, pulled on by a force you can't explain, you enter the chamber of a godlike AI. Called Five Pebbles, of all things, this non-traditional deity is nonetheless transcendently powerful, his mainframe so large that the superstructure rises high above the clouds. And this machine is not just a god, but a mad one. Five this Pebbles' kind of actions cool. have birthed creeping um, terrors that prowl in the depths, destroyed vast regions of the world, and even damaged other, friendlier intelligences. Like in the world of Berserk, the sickness of the sovereign deity manifests as the sickness in the land itself. Except, Five Pebbles isn't just a deity, but a creation. He was built by a now vanished group of super beings called the Ancients, and his failures are just warped attempts at following his original programming. There is a tragedy to this character that can only be fully understood after playing the Saints campaign, a story set far in Rainworld's future where a terrible frost is slowly dimming away the world. Here you can find the ruins of Five Pebbles malfunctioning alone in the snow, his resources exhausted trying to fix past mistakes. Thank you for company, he says, without a hint of his past ire. You can, if you so choose, stay with this discarded creation as the cold slowly overtakes you. Two beings abandoned by their gods. Wow. The idea of a mad god creating another mad god brings out a theme that haunts the margins of all previously mentioned works, that of dysfunctional parenthood. Five Pebbles is very much a discarded child of the Ancients. The fear and hunger deity Valtiel births his own ruined form of life only to abandon it. Senua and Indica's visions are both at least partially the result of parental mistreatment. Even Griffith has the Void, a manipulative deity who helped with grandfathering him into the whole evil god thing. But few stories make this framing as explicit as the Spine of Night. A rotoscoped animated movie that sometimes looks like a Joel Haver skit, but is pretty classic fantasy until, who oh boy. So near the end of the film, we learn that the land this story takes place on is made from the skull of a dead god, and the world's first deities rose from its dream, and humans were created from the dreams of those deities. With me so far? Then, because of the cruelty of these gods, humans rise up against them, essentially children killing their own parents. Okay, and then it turns out that the entire universe is an endless chain of this exact cycle of infinite gods killing gods killing gods. All of reality is just a never-ending loop of cosmic parasite and, like, what? This twist comes right out of nowhere and is basically never brought up again. It's so bonkers. And yet I don't think it's as foreign a concept as one might think. Creation slaying their own mad creators is a surprisingly prevalent motif throughout mythology. The Greek pantheon has Zeus destroying his cannibalistic father, who destroyed his father before him. Babylonian and Mesopotamian myth have near-identical stories of parasitical violence. Norse mythology has Fafnir murdering his cruel sorcerer father, and becoming a dragon as consequence. It is a grim, weird pattern that can easily get pretty Freudian, but I think there's more to these cycles of inherited violence than meets the eye. In the film Poor Things, a mad god creates a new form of life the only way he knows how, violently. God, short for Godwin, is a doctor who transplants the brain of an infant into its own deceased mother, creating a new tabula rasa of being. Fittingly, God in Poor Things parallels the archetypal mad scientist, most overtly Victor Frankenstein, and his creation, Bella, acts as a kind of Frankenstein's monster, a childlike being whose rebellion against their creator leads them to knowledge and, eventually, resentment towards their imperfect parental figure. For as is the case with Frankenstein's monster, from Bella's perspective, God is both her father and, well, he's God, in the same way that all parents are initially deified by their children. So what does one do if they discover their God is mad? In his book, It Didn't Start With You, Mark Wolin writes on inherited trauma. How chronic or repetitive emotions like anger and fear can imprint on a child across generations. Notably, Godwin himself is actually another Frankenstein's monster, tortured and experimented on by his own father, driving him to conduct his own experiments. If you look for it, Poor Things is its own causal chain of cruel gods creating cruel gods. Except, 
Though Bella eventually gains the capacity to understand her dark conception, she doesn't seek revenge on God in the way of Frankenstein's creation. She is both disappointed by and ultimately sympathetic to her father figure, aware that God, despite his mistakes, tried to raise her with a kindness his own father never gave him. It is a thorny, tangled portrait of parent and child, creator and creation, madness and love, one that speaks to the inherent moral complexities of creating life. I am finding being alive fascinating, so I'll forgive you the act. What does a creator owe their creation? It's a question lurking in the claymation short film Adam, which, despite its silliness, really freaked me out as a kid. A goofy adaptation of Genesis, basically, Adam begins with a clay figure who is ignorant and beast-like, even going as far as to bite the hand of his maker. As punishment, Adam is essentially tormented by the divine hand that feeds him. You could read this as the story of a cruel parent, but Adam was created by Ardman, the same studio that gave us claymation classics like Wallace and Gromit, and the medium of clay itself feels indispensable to the themes Adam is broaching. Claymation, like all forms of stop motion, is a maddeningly labor-intensive process of creation, requiring the artist's constant hands on their art to give them life. Viewed through this lens, the hand in Adam isn't just the hand of a parent or a mad god, it's the hand of the animator, which is appropriate. Because when it comes to fiction, those are basically the same thing. In creating a world, an author is both parent and god, presiding, sometimes cruelly, over the lives of their characters. Few films explore this as overtly as The Adventures of Mark Twain, another work of claymation which is just so too. deeply bizarre I don't know that I have a chance at explaining it. To oversimplify, the story follows Mark Twain, the author, who has built an airship which contains portals to all his works of literature, including a real unfinished novel called The Mysterious Stranger. Then, in a wildly metafictional scene, we see this world is an incomplete void, inhabited only by an all-powerful angel, who goes by his given name of Satan. And though seemingly aware he is but a thought, an incomplete story within a story, Satan decides to make life of his own. What follows is what I interpret to be a portrait of the creative process in miniature. At first, Satan's creations are simple, fittingly resembling most animators' first experiments with claymation. But then, his little society starts to organize. Plots become more complex, characters take on a life of their own, and things, well, they start to get ugly. So Satan does what any mad god, any author might do when a story isn't working. It seems vital to mention that Mark Twain began writing The Mysterious Stranger in 1897, a year after his daughter died of meningitis, and the versions of the story that have survived are filled with Twain's famous distrust of organized religion, as well as a larger bitterness and rage at the nature of the world. Most copies end with the character of Satan declaring reality is nothing but a grotesque and foolish dream, and that is, in fact, quite literally true in the strange meta setup of the film. No matter how much life he creates or how many worlds he destroys, the Satan of the adventures of Mark Twain cannot escape the fact that he occupies a lower rung in the ladder of cruel deities. He is a character trapped within his own medium, his clay mask changing shape so frequently you can almost see the sculptor's fingerprints. It seems like a reminder that it is the author who is the true mad god behind the mad gods of fiction. A literary character like Victor Frankenstein might create life, but only because writer Mary Shelley was inspired to craft her tale of a creator who inhumanly rejects his creation. Not long after her father, last name Godwin, disowned her. She dedicated Frankenstein to him, by the way. One cruel god creates another. Of course, narratives often necessitate cruelty on the part of their authors. The real reason the creator deities of the Wind Waker flooded the land is because, well, the developers thought this act would make the setting more interesting. And they were right. Hell, the entire Zelda franchise is built on a divine and bloody curse, a promise of infinitely repeating suffering that haunts the main characters across their endless reincarnations. It's about the darkest punishment a mad god could come up with, but it also makes for fun games. 
To be clear, I'm not saying authors casting misfortunes down upon their characters are somehow doing something morally wrong. You don't owe the same things to a fictional person you create that you would your child. But I think it's inevitable that these concepts intertwine, that mad gods in storytelling often reflect both their authors and models of parenthood. To create anything is to gain a power that can, on some level, be read as godlike, and the question of what one does with that power… If there is an answer, a single work that could serve as a treatise on what happens after a god goes mad, well, appropriately, I think that would be Mad God, a stop-motion yeah, film created by animator Phil Tippett over a period of 30 years. Mad God is a colossal monument to madness and birth and creative obsession and is also just legitimately nuts. Mad God begins with the main character descending into a hellish world in a diving bell, lowering past impossibly vast fossilized remains towards a realm of utter insanity. Mad God's setting is a never-ending parade of depravity, one that it seems only the cruelest deity could dream up, let alone build. When watching the film, it's impossible to forget the fact that what you're seeing was to an extent physically created. Stop motion requires material props to be dragged around one frame at a time. All this machinery of cruelty is, to a greater degree than most fiction, real machinery. In a way, it seems inexplicable that someone would create so much just as a vehicle for destruction, and in a way, it makes perfect sense. Mad God is the result of three decades of painstaking development, and the struggles that come with that feel entrenched in the world itself. The title can definitely be read as autobiographical. It isn't clear if there is a more textual mad god within the world of the film, an overseer managing this forsaken realm, or if the world is simply the result of a network of individuals choosing to be monstrous. It seems worth noting that the main character is not elevated from the cruelty of his surroundings. One of the first things we see him do is step on this weird little group of gnomes, seemingly just because he can. The only justification any character in Mad God seems to have. Is that why this monolith of a film was made? To show us that anyone given sufficient power will inevitably misuse it? Possibly. But at the end of Mad God, a denizen of this world creates a new universe. It is a mesmerizing sequence, a dizzying time-lapse of creation made primarily through practical effects, and it begs the question, why? Why would the director, who can create such beautiful sequences, instead choose to reign over his creation as a wrathful deity? There must be some reason, some grand design, some explanation that will cause everything to make sense. And then the film ends. For all that can be thematically gleaned from mad gods, all the echoes of power, creativity, and cycles of suffering, if a god's meaning can be perfectly understood, well, they aren't all that mad then, are they? Indeed, part of why these stories matter is they remind us cruelty is not always rational, that sometimes looking for reasoning can miss the point. To entertain the idea of the divine succumbing to insanity is to accept that the universe isn't always a place of complete saneness, that not all hardships are perfectly sensible. When we tell tales of mad gods, we acknowledge the unpredictability of life's sorrows, and perhaps there is a strange comfort in that. Maybe life is but a grotesque and foolish dream, maybe it's mad gods all the way down, but it can be oddly reassuring when a work grapples with meaning and concludes that sometimes things are just tough, and it's not your fault. All any creation can do is decide how they want to create. And as always, Thanks for watching. Yeah, if man. you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video. Yeah, um, um, once again, this is What Happens After a God Goes Mad by Curious Archive. Um, this guy, good brain food. Uh, show him some love. Like, subscribe, share, follow, all those things. They help me out tremendously. Be safe, be happy, be healthy. I love you all. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Have a good night.